Good morning. Our text this morning is from John 21, which is the lovely story about how the heartbroken Peter goes fishing because he probably feels guilty about the things that happened with Jesus before the crucifixion, his betrayal. And um, then Jesus meets him by the shore, although they don't know it's him at first. And they have this lovely meal of bread and fish. And Peter and Jesus have an exchange in which Peter is restored to his position as apostle. That's the way most people view it. Uh, it's John 21. I would encourage you to read it. Um, since I'm covering a fair amount of ground today, I won't read the whole thing myself, but you'll be able to pick up bits and pieces of it during the sermon. Here we go. So this is the sort of a part two sermon, because way back on May 8th, Mother's Day, I spoke not only about mothers, but women. And today is June 19th, Father's Day, and I speak not only about fathers, but men. Uh, in some ways, this is pretty easy. Um, most of the great things in human history uh, have been achieved by men. There are, of course, notable exceptions, but it is fair to say that most uh, great rulers, most great explorers, most great generals, most great religious leaders, most great scholars, most scientists, astronauts, inventors, legislators, lawyers, doctors, plumbers, electricians, construction managers, architects, etc., have all been men. Um, men are also the best athletes. Our physical structure seems to give us an innate advantage in sports. That's why there's always separate competitions for men and women. Men have a long record of achievement from thousands of years of history, although it doesn't hurt that men also wrote most of that history. There, uh, that's why uh, there is a Women's History Month in March, but no Men's History Month. In a sense, every month is Men's History Month. But then there's also the dark side of all this. Men also get credit for most of the rapes, murders, and beatings of history. Of the major, sh major shooting events this spring, the murders in Buffalo, the attack at a Taiwanese Presbyterian church in California, the massacre of children in Uvalde, Texas, and the recent church shooting in Alabama, all were committed by men. Men have also been responsible for most of the slavery in history. Men have also oppressed women and devalued their abilities and contributions. A um, notable recent example being the Taliban in Afghanistan dictating face covering for women and forbidding them to be educated. They are continuing a sad and long-standing tradition, I'm afraid. Author Margaret Atwood once asked a male friend why men feel threatened by women, and he answered, we are afraid women will laugh at us. She then asked a group of women why they felt threatened by men, and they said, we're afraid men will kill us. That is probably the core reason for a whole genre of literature about women giving men their comeuppance. Uh, the best example in the Bible is about a character named J.L. When the uh, enemy general Sisera shows up at her door, she invites him in, suggests he gets a little sleep, here's your warm milk, and then makes sure he never leaves. The prophetess Deborah offers this prayer about J.L. in Judges 5. Most blessed of women be J.L., the wife of Heber the Kenite, most blessed of tent-dwelling women. He asked for water, and she gave him milk. In a bowl fit for nobles, she brought him curdled milk. Then her hand reached for the tent peg, her right hand for the workman's hammer. She struck Sisera, she crushed his head, and she shattered and pierced his temple. At her feet he sank, he fell, there he lay. At her feet he sank, he fell, where he lay, there he fell, dead. That was Deborah's prayer of praise and gratitude. Please don't bring me anything like that in our prayer joys and concerns today. Do men deserve their bad reputation? We probably do. We are sinners and we have had the power and authority. 
It was not so at creation. In Genesis 1.27, God makes both men and women in God's image in seeming equality. But in Genesis 3, after the proverbial apple has been eaten, God pronounces the judgment that everyone will pay for that sin. The snake, the woman, and the man all get different penalties. Part of the woman's penalty is that the man will rule over her, Genesis 3.16. Please notice that this is not part of God's plan from creation. It was a consequence of human sin, part of the curse, the curse that we believe is being undone in Christ where there is no longer male nor female, Galatians 3.28. Now that we are in Christ, we are one. But men have to be careful. Proverbs has an abundance of good advice on fathering. Proverbs 3, 11 to 12, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father the son he delights in. Proverbs 1, 8 to 11, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to, your, to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. My son, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let us lie and wait for innocent blood. Let's ambush some harmless soul. Do not give in to them. Proverbs 23, 26 to 28. My child, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. For a prostitute is a deep pit, an adulteress is a narrow well. She lies in wait like a robber and increases the number of the faithless. Proverbs 23, 31 to 33. Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights and your mind will imagine confusing things. All good cautions for young men. My father was not perfect, but he instilled some of these things in me and I expect your fathers did for many of you. And for those fathers who hear my voice, I expect you taught your sons and daughters things like these. And on this Father's Day, I thank you. But there is less guidance for young men in our country today. The high number of uh, children being raised in single parent households is not good. Something is wrong with young men today. Some of it is on them and their individual sin. Some of it is on all of us. Somehow we collectively have created a society where such things are commonplace. All of us in this country share in that sin. How did we let this happen? Well, let us now turn to a brief study of one man of faith. He was born with the name Simon on the Sea of Galilee 2,000 years ago, give or take. He was a married man at the time he met Jesus, or possibly a widower. We don't think he ever had any children. Jesus decided to call him the Rock, um, which would have been Cephas in the language they were speaking, or Peter when it gets written down in Greek. I'll call him Peter. He was a fisherman by trade, and he was so overwhelmed by Jesus at their first meeting that he fell on his knees and exclaimed, Go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. Jesus tells him, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. And the story is often rolling from there. Of all the apostles, Peter is the one that comes across with what we consider to be the most typical male characteristics. He's always the first to step forward, which means he alone gets to take a few steps on the surface of the water before he gets frightened and starts sinking. Uh, sorry. He is quick to speak, which earns him the honor of being the first to name Jesus as God's Messiah. But then he keeps right on talking and earns a rebuke from Jesus. Get behind me, Satan. 
One of my favorite stories about Peter comes when Jesus is going to watch the disciples' feed. Peter exclaims, Oh, you, you'll never watch my feed? And Jesus replies, Unless I wash you, you have no part of me. And Peter comes back with, Then wash my, my head and my hands too. No, says Jesus, just the feet. You're clean enough. Peter is either all in or not in at all. He never lacks for gusto. But Jesus is looking for some other qualities, obedience and love. Peter has a hard lesson to learn in that regard. He makes his famous declaration that he will follow Jesus even unto death followed by his deep shame when Jesus' prediction that Jesus will deny him three times comes to pass. Cock-a-doodle-doo. This leads us to our scene by the shore from John 21. Many people believe this passage represents Peter's restoration or perhaps reconciliation with Jesus. I think it shows a transition from the immature Peter filled with bravado to the wiser, spirit-filled leader we begin to see in the book of Acts. So what happens in John 21? At the very high level, Peter does a very man-like thing. He's feeling sad, guilty, and inadequate. So what does he do? He goes fishing with some buddies. His human effort to deal with his emotions completely fails. Not only doesn't he feel any better, they can't even catch any fish. Then some idiot on the shore tells them to move the net from this side of the boat to that side of the boat, which is what, like five feet apart? <laughs> and uh, they do it and are completely overwhelmed with the enormous catch. The nets are full. And suddenly, Peter gets an enormous flash of deja vu from when he first met Jesus and realizes that at idiot on the shore is really the risen Christ. Full of passion, he jumps in the water and swims straight to Jesus. The other disciples follow, bringing the fish. None are lost. But Jesus has some other fish. He is already caught, cleaned, and cooked for a fabulous breakfast. There are a lot of subtleties to the dialogue between Peter and Jesus, but you'll have to join our Wednesday Bible study to talk about them. What I want to briefly summarize this morning is Peter's transformation from impulsive disciple to spiritual leader. I'll be quoting liberally from an article by Samuel Wells for this part. By this time, Peter has come to realize an important and painful truth. Passion alone is not enough. Not just because other things are required, but because passionate commitment is often made up of the kinds of tendencies we see so clearly in Peter. An assumption that one is superior to others, a profound but misplaced confidence in one's own depend dependability, and a sense that one knows better than Jesus. If passion alone is not enough, what else is needed? Well, first of all, forgiveness. The forgiveness Jesus brings dissolves Peter's arrogance in assuming that he has outstanding qualities. Jesus' encounter with Peter by the lakeshore is a commissioning based not on Peter's qualities, but on God's grace. Chief among these is love. Love for Jesus must equate to love for other people, but the love itself is a gift of grace. Our innate capacity for love is not the criteria. Our faithful obedience as we seek to love both God and neighbor is. Notice that in verse 15, Peter cannot even assert that he loves Jesus more than the other disciples. That's actually a good thing. No, the Peter of John 21 can never again assume that Jesus has chosen him because he is particularly able or particularly committed or particularly faithful. Peter may never know why Jesus has chosen him, but he will discover that the qualities he will require are the ones that only Jesus can provide. The forgiveness Jesus brings also dissolves Peter's sense of superiority over the other disciples. 
Peter must know that his betrayal of Jesus being set against such grand promises are as great as any betrayal, save perhaps that of Judas. There is no hope in trying to set himself above his friends, even if he saw any benefit in doing so before. Jesus invites Peter to renew his discipleship in response to the new life he has been offered through resurrection and forgiveness. Follow me. Jesus' forgiveness dissolves another of Peter's bad habits, his temptation to assume that he knows better than Jesus. This is the subtext of the extent in, intense exchange around the question where Jesus asks, Do you love me? Peter still cannot quite realize that Jesus' logic is unassailable. Jesus' logic is a logic of resurrection, a logic unique to Jesus, without comparison, analogy, or alternative. Much as it is understandable that Peter struggles with this new logic, his struggle is not really useful or commendable. We often speak about forgiveness if it, as if it had only to do with our humanity. We rattle off notions about how everyone deserves a second chance, that bitterness hurts the victim more than the sinner, that time heals most things, and while there is some truth to these, such human logic is insufficient. The real logic of forgiveness has no foundation other than resurrection. Resurrection knows the power of death, yet loves with the force of life. This is the only logic that truly sustains, truly forgives. Just as Jesus was raised to new life, so are we. New life means, well, new life. In its newness, we find that we are redeemed and transformed. Everything about us, including our manhood and womanhood, is redeemed and transformed. Whatever sinful qualities we had, including our bravado and passions, are transformed into what is needed for the kingdom. Peter's impetuousness is cultivated into a new kind of leadership grounded in obedience and love and the power of the Spirit. My friends, May everything that is in us, all aspects of our personalities, be similarly transformed by the logic of resurrection and newness so that we too may serve the kingdom. Like Peter's redemption, our redemption is not just for us. It is not some self-help project. With our forgiveness comes freedom and new life, and now we are free to love Jesus and to feed Jesus' sheep, all of them. Our twofold love of God and neighbor is enlisted for the service of the kingdom and the service of the world. And what good news that is. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Happy Father's Day.